Well, good morning. Merry Christmas to all of you. And I am so uh, excited to be here among you this morning as we celebrate to, together the birth of our Savior. What a, what a special day it is for us to remember the faithfulness of God that, that came to us in, in human flesh. Amen. In uh, Luke chapter 2, there's a passage that is so familiar to us in this Christmas time of year, and especially on Christmas Day. And in Luke chapter 2, we read this. And Joseph went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, which was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her first son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on peace or on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, this morning we, we come to you on this Christmas morning that has been set aside for us to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords who has, who has condescended to us and come to us in the flesh. I've been born as a child, but Father, we thank you that that, that wasn't the end. Father, thank you that, that he displayed, as we will see today, the glory of God, and we beheld that glory. And we beheld it in his grace and his truth that he came to us in Christ on the cross. Father, thank you so much for that gift. And this morning, may we worship you and bow before the holiness and the goodness and the graciousness of God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. What an amazing grace it is that, that God humbled himself and took on flesh to be born as a helpless child and, and to be put into the feeding trough of a donkey to sleep. And, and this birth, as we just read, of the king and the creator of the world was, was proclaimed to us by the glorious hosts of, uh, of heaven to the shepherds, the shepherds that were in a field. And what condescension from the highest of heights to the, to the lowliest of men. But praise God this morning that, that though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. That's grace this morning that I, I can't even fathom when I look at my own sinfulness and, and the sinfulness of mankind and then, and then contemplate the awesome holiness of God. I'm overwhelmed to think that, that God would condescend to us, to take on our likeness and, and do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Praise God for that grace. And, and today we worship the God for that manifestation of His glory and grace who came to us in Christ. And last week, Ray opened up for us uh, John chapter 1, and we saw the eternal God became flesh. He condescended to us. He, he took on human flesh and he, he walked among us. He walked among men, setting on display the glory of God. In our verses this morning that we will be looking at, in verses 14 through 17 of, of John chapter 1, we're, we're going to see John proclaiming to us the, the glory that they saw in Christ as he walked among them. And how that glory was manifested both in grace and in truth. And all these terms I just mentioned, the, the glory of God, His grace and His truth, they're all so familiar to us as Christians. We, we talk about them constantly, but, but I fear because of our familiarity with them that we have maybe missed the wonder and the awe 
and humbling reverence that they should inspire within us. So my goal this morning is, as we look at this text, then that you would again see the glory of God that is set upon display in Christ. And that you would fall in love with His grace again and be humbled to see our immense need of His sovereign grace. And I truly believe that is exactly what the heart of John was as he penned this book that his hearers would see the awesome glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. So let's look at our text this morning in, in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, beginning of verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only begotten Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16, For from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. If you ask me if there is one theme throughout all of Scripture that I, I see repeated over and over, it would be the glory of God. God's purpose in all of creation and His plan of salvation that He desired before uh, eternity past has been to set on display the glory of God. Romans chapter 1, for what we can know about God is plain to them because God has what? Shown it to them for His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. Ephesians 1 tells us that the plan of God for the fullness of time was to unite all things in Jesus Christ. And God has set Himself on display in all of His glory, in all of His infinite attributes, in the things that He has made and what He has done to save us. And now as John looks back at his time that he spent with Christ and, and he begins to write this epistle, he, he wants his readers to understand one thing. That this all-glorious Messiah who has come, he was, he was not just another chosen lamb. He was not just another picked-out sacrifice. This one who came to take away the sin of man is none other than the eternal Word that existed in eternity past. The very one through whom the world was created, and he is none other than God himself. John Labors, as Ray laid out for us last week, to, to set on display who this Savior was and the glorious fact that He became flesh and He dwelt among us. And that should cause us to, to lift up our hands in worship even this morning. And John has been laying out for us in this first chapter who Christ was. And now in our verses this morning, we have, we have John telling us what they saw in Christ. How did they see Christ? This glory of God. In verse 14 it says, And we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten Son of God. What a powerful thought. Then in the person of Jesus Christ, they saw the very glory of God. Somehow this has lost its weight with us today. In the Old Testament, the glory of God caused man to, to run and hide, to stay away for the awesome fear that that glory brought. Exodus 24, it, it says, The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, He called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of all the people of Israel. God was a holy, awesome, untouchable God whose glory was set on display for the children of Israel to see constantly. And the picture of God's glory was one that, that depicted absolute power, perfect holiness, unwavering justice, and, and the list goes on of all the attributes of God that are, that are wrapped up in His glory. In Psalm 29.9 says, "...the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and the strips the forest bare." And in His temple all cry glory. At the sight of God's glory, man and beast are both overwhelmed and, and they cannot survive in His awesome presence, but yet that very glory, that very glory is what John says we saw in Christ. 
And though veiled in certain ways here on earth, the, the essence of, of God in man is what they saw. And I'm reminded again in Exodus 33 in the, the famous context where we see uh, uh, Moses come and he asks God, let me see your glory. Exodus 33, 18 and 19, Moses asks, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I stop right there and I ask Moses, Moses, what, what are you asking for? I mean, think about it. M Moses, Moses has seen and spoke with God in the burning bush. He's watched God do miraculous things in bringing Israel out of Egypt. He, God's parted the Red Sea right in front of him. He, he watched God do miraculous things in the wilderness, such as bring out food and, and water and such. And the glory of God led them by a pillar of smoke by day and a and fire by night. He watched the glory of God descend on Mount Sinai and, and his promise or his holiness promised to consume any who would even touch that mountain. And after the tabernacle was built, he saw the glory of God descend on it and dwell there. And then Moses in Exodus 33 says this. Thus the Lord used to speak with Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Now look at all these interactions with, that God had with Moses, and, and, and Moses seemed to have something that was so personal and intimate. And, and I sit back and say, Moses, if anyone has seen the glory of God, it, it's you. What, what do you still long to see when you ask, God, show me your glory? And as I meditated on this, and, and I meditated again on John 1.14, I, I think maybe I'm, I'm saying what Moses was, was longing for. See, he had seen all these manifestations of, of the glory of God, but yet God was still just something he saw the power and the holiness of. He heard the voice of God speak to him, but he was longing to see God in all of his glory and in, in, in something that was, that was tangible. See, God was a spirit, and, and though Moses had interactions with him, that, that uh, uh, even though he had those interactions, he never had anything that he could, he could put his hands on. That was, he never had the essence of his absolute glorious God. He was groping to be able to add some context to, to who God really was. He knew seeing God directly would, would consume him because of God's holiness. But yet, but yet Moses just wanted to see something. He just wanted to catch a glimpse of this God. And so he asked God, show me your glory. I want to be able to, to grasp more of who you are, oh God. You've been so much a part of my life and my everyday experience. I, I just want to see your glory. I think picking up on that, John is striving to show to his readers by direct inference to the story of Moses and Moses' request that this Jesus Christ is the eternal God and the creator of all things that, that Moses caught just a glimpse of of in his glory but he is now the very one who is walking with us in human flesh and we personally see the very glory of God the very glory of God that Moses was looking for in addition to all that he had already seen it, it is here he is here in Jesus Christ the fullness of the the glory of God is now standing before them in human flesh and Luke, in the verses we've already read this morning, goes back to the manger and shows the, the humble condescension of God to be born as a child. John comes and tells us this morning who this humble child is, and he is none other than the glorious Creator, God. How awesome is that? Behold our, our glorious God this morning, church. Behold our glorious Savior. Let that... Let that sink in this morning. We are, we are not here to worship an innocent, cuddly baby in a manger alone. We are worshiping the God and glory, or the glory of God come in human flesh, sent to die for us and to, to make us His own. That's what we are here to worship this morning. And even as Christ was in the garden and getting close to the, to the crucifixion, and remember the guards come to to, to him, and they're, they're looking for Christ, and, and Christ asks who it is that, that you are looking for. And when they respond, Jesus, 
Christ then tells them, I am He, and it, it sends them to the ground. As one commentator uh, uh, spoke, he said that at the end of uh, Christ's life, as His uh, time was growing near, his, his veil was wearing thin. And men around them even more began to see the awesome glory of God shine through. That God who was the consuming fire in the Old Testament is the one who is now walking with them day to day. How overwhelming of a thought is that? But oh, it gets even better. It gets even better. Not only has the glory of God come to men in flesh, in the flesh of Jesus Christ, but I ask the question, how did you see that glory, John? How is it that you saw this, this amazing glory of God? What was the essence of that glory that he set on display? Were there flashes of lightning and, and consuming light emanating from him? And what was it that they were seeing and worshiping as the glory of God? Verse 14 goes on, as, as we have seen his glory, glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. How did you see His glory, John? What was the essence of the glory that you saw in Jesus Christ? Full of grace and truth. That's what John and those around him with with faith saw. The word full, as most commentators agree, is is pointing back and modifying the glory. It It was His glory that was manifesting itself in Christ as being full of grace and truth. And I want to go back for a moment to Exodus 33. Because I think we're going to see a great correlation between our text this morning and God revealing Himself to Moses. Verse 19 of Exodus 33, and He said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Once again, think about the context that Moses has with God and all the magnificent pictures of the glory of God that he has experienced. The all-consuming holiness of God that he has seen as well as the infinite power he has witnessed. And and he asked God then to show him his glory. And you you sit almost on the edge of your seat in the middle of this story and and you're anticipating, God, what are you going to show him? What is it you're going to show him after all these manifestations of your, your glory? How is God going to respond? And I have to say, how God does respond is very enlightening. He tells him, I will cause my goodness to pass before you, and I will proclaim my name before you. And then he proceeds to do what? He proceeds to tell Moses about his attributes of his sovereign grace and mercy. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. See, here is the goodness of God before Moses, that he is gracious and merciful. Those are the things that God declares as reveals him, as he reveals himself to Moses. God has reminded Moses that he is about to grant him the, the glimpse of his glory and he, that he was asking for and, and that he is only granting this out of his grace. And that His grace and mercy is the glory that is going to pass before Him. Do you get that? God's sovereign grace has been shown in in all of the history of Israel. He's called them out of the nations and He has set His love upon them. and, And through them He is bringing about His promises to all men. The very fact of God revealing Himself to fallen men through Israel and then the grace of God that shows His character in giving them the law. It's all been out of grace. Paul reiterates this point in Romans chapter 9. He says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. And then Paul, in that context, goes on to describe the sovereignty of God's grace to those whom He has chosen. And God is gracious to Moses and all Israel because He's revealed Himself to them. The law given to them set on display for men to see the the character of God 
and who he was. And John's point here in John 1 is this, the fulfillment of the law, the very essence of all that that the law pointed to and set on display, it's here. It's here. Here in the flesh and blood before us, and, and we beheld the glory in the graciousness of God to do all that he has promised for fallen man. As a side note, you, you may be asking, well, is, is the law gracious? Well, yes and no. Yes, it was gracious in the fact that holy God would reveal himself to us and, and show us just a glimpse of his glory. But no, the law itself offered no more grace than that of revelation. And I believe that is the point that John is driving at here in this text to his readers. Fall on your face and and worship God. Worship the God of all creation because He's come to us and and has been revealed in flesh and blood. And in the person of Jesus Christ, we have seen the very very, uh, flesh and blood, the very glory of God, just as Moses did, but all in such a greater way. If Moses had a glimpse of the glory of God in the Old Testament, we now have the bright and shining sun of God standing right in front of us, setting on display the glory of God and the grace of God. And I pray that is landing heavy on your heart this morning. If you want to see the full glory of God, you must see it in the grace of Jesus Christ this morning. The things of which First Peter, it says, angels even long to look. The things that even those who are in the very presence of God, day and night as they worship Him, the glory of God they have no comprehension of in grace. And that grace that stoops down and takes on the sinfulness of man that we may be His child is the expression of the glory of God that John says they saw in Christ. And it would really take weeks for us to unpack all that is in that word and that concept of of grace, that that undeserved, unmerited favor of God. The very key to the gospel was that was made only possible through the death of Christ for us. Grace, the the very thing that set on display the glory of God in Christ. Do you comprehend the, the beauty of what John is trying to tell us this morning? And it just keeps getting better. Stay with me just for a little bit. It's, it's getting better. Verse 16, from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Did you get that? From His fullness. From His fullness. John just told us in, in verse 14 that they saw His glory and it was full of grace and truth. Now he builds on that and he says, from that fullness, from the fullness of his grace and truth that we saw, from that infinite well of grace that is found in in Christ, we have all received grace upon grace. I think we would all theologically uh, speaking agree. It's true that, that in Christ we do receive grace that is Upon grace, it comes in like waves upon waves on a beach that that just keeps coming one on top of another. Theologically, that's that's true. There's so much overwhelming grace in Christ that comes at us wave upon wave every moment of our, our lives. To ever step outside of that grace, we would be consumed. All agreed. But may I say and endeavor to show you this morning that I don't think that's what John is trying to tell us in this text. John has taken a step back in this chapter here, way before the manger, way before Moses, way before Abraham, all the way back to eternity past to tell us who this Savior is that has come into the world. He's told us that He is none other than the Creator God who is here. And in beholding Him, we have seen His infinite glory, glory that that is manifest in His grace. And I'm going to tie this together in a moment, but but I believe the reference for John, as we've already looked at here, is back to Moses and his beholding the glory of God and seeing God declare His graciousness to man. But how now in Christ we have the fulfillment of all those things pointed to. Here's what I believe John is saying in in referring back to Moses. 
if there was grace given to mankind and the manifestations of His glory to men, and in the calling of Israel and the giving of the law, if all of that was a display of God's grace in the Old Testament, then now, in the person of Jesus Christ, from the fullness of the glory of God displayed in the grace of Christ, we have all received grace, get this, instead of grace, or grace on top of grace, grace for grace. The Greek preposition here used for, for grace upon grace is, is the word anti. And it, it's, it's interpreted here in the NAS and the ESV, here in this verse only, as upon. It, nowhere else in Scripture is it, is it interpreted that way. The, the King James interprets this word, I feel rightly, as grace for grace. Every other use of this word in the, in the New Testament, it's, it's really interpreted as instead of, on top of, or, or for in Matthew, we see it used, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. In Luke 11, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? The whole idea here, I believe, is profound. Because if John wanted to, to mean wave upon wave of grace, he would, have, he would have used a different preposition. He would have used epi instead of anti. And you say, yeah, so what's, what's the point? Get to the point. Here it is. John, John is referring to Moses and the grace of God and revealing himself to him and showing his glory is set on display in the glory of God and that grace. But if that was an amazing, glorious display of the grace of God, then what we have here standing right in front of us is the ultimate display of God's grace. We now have grace in place of grace. This grace and truth that, that we received in Christ is head and shoulders above anything that Moses and Israel would have ever seen. Ever seen. I want you to see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is very explicit here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpassed it. For if what has been being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. See, John wants his readers to see that, that this grace we have now in Christ is a grace that replaces grace. It is instead of grace. It is in place of grace. See, if the revelation of God's glory to Moses was a grace, then here in the flesh of Christ, standing before us, we have a, received a grace that, that so far surpasses that grace. And John wants you and I to get the point. That God was always gracious in revealing Himself to, nan, to man, but, but now in the person of Jesus Christ, we have the ultimate revelation of that glory and grace. A grace that is so much greater. So much greater than what Moses ever saw. Turn with me uh, to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. We'll look at this one more place. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 through 25. The writer picks up on, on this idea of how much greater Christ is than anything they ever saw in the Old Testament. He says, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given to him. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Huh. But here it is. But you, you have come to Mount Zion. 
and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the word of the blood of Abel. That grace that flows to us from the fullness of Christ is that that is on top of or instead of the grace that God had given in the old covenant. A grace that so far surpasses any grace that came before because it's grace that not only reveals uh, God and His holiness, but now provides the way that we can be made right with that God of holiness. A grace that rather than condemning us in our sin and posting it to the billboard of our hearts has done what it takes to forgive that sin. That's the glory of what we are here worshiping this morning as Christ has come in the, in the little child. That He is the very glory of God. Praise God for His grace this morning that comes to us and so far surpasses anything they had in the law. And verse 17 of our text, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. There's the connection. There's the connection. For from His fullness we have all received grace that replaces grace. In verse 17, for the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Let that minister to your hearts this morning as, as we worship God for sending us His Son. The love of God and His grace to us is so unfathomable. Ephesians chapter 2, But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your doing. It is the gift of God. Praise God for His amazing grace that comes to us this Christmas and that's what I want us to see. It is all grace laying in that manger. What love the Father has had for us to give us His Son to redeem us and make us His own. In a song entitled, Oh, How He Loves, there's a line that says this, We are His portion, and He is our prize. Have you thought about that? That I am the portion of Christ and that He is my prize, drawn to redemption by the grace in His eyes. If grace is an ocean, then we're all sinking. And God is drowning us this morning in an ocean of grace. A quote from Tim Keller as I close. It was shared, for me, shared with me last week. really sums it all up. It says this. A God who was only holy would not have come down to us in Jesus Christ, he would have simply demanded that we pull ourselves together and that we be a moral and holy enough to merit a relationship with him. A deity that was all accepting God of love would not have needed to come to earth either. This God of the modern imagination would have just overlooked sin and evil and embraced us. Neither the God of moralism nor the God of relativism would have bothered with Christmas. Praise God that He did bother with Christmas. And He sent us His Son who is perfectly holy and yet full of grace and truth. We worship this morning the same God who descended on the mountain in holy fire and caused them to fear and tremble. But because of Christ, Christ we, we now come to Him and we cry, Abba, Father. Thank God for His grace this morning. Let's pray. Father, we are so overwhelmed. This morning, we, 
We often get lost in the, in the picture of, of a baby in a manger and, and the cuddliness of that picture. But Father, thank you that, that as John has showed us, that, that very child was God in the flesh. The very one who created all things, the very one who, who caused so much fear and trembling within, within men as you were revealing yourself. But Father, oh, we thank you that it was not just your holiness, it was your grace that was set on display. And Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ who, who came and set on display that glory. Father, we worship you for that this morning because that glory is what brought your grace and your truth to us in Christ. Father, we can now bow before you and say, Abba, Father, because of that amazing grace that you have given to us in Christ. Father, thank you that you did bother with Christmas. Thank you that, that uh, you were not only holy, but you were loving and gracious and did what it took to satisfy that holiness in Christ. Father, may we worship you today for all that you have done for us in him. In your son's name.